Hi, I'm Isadita, and um, we're going to go ahead and talk about the video that I found um, and discuss it. Um, you're going to see me looking more towards the second screen. It's because my laptop itself, the screen is broken, so I had to get another monitor and pick it up that way. I know it's a little bit ghetto, but hey, you got to do what you got to do. Um, so, let's stay tuned and let's go ahead and watch the video and discuss it. Um, The one we're talking about is you saw it above um, from my blog. If you haven't, check out I studied this blog. Um, it's called Ancient Archaeology. So, that's Michael Keller. Thank you very much. Right, I spent the last two days since I've arrived racking my brain how to squeeze a four hour presentation into two hours. It has not been easy. So I'm going to go through okay, this at so a pace. In commentary, not what, because what he's saying right here I is. I don't want um, to confuse you or myself, but is, I feel when you find like something mind boggling. I leave anything out. I feel like I'm robbing you of valuable content. And you know, what do you leave out of something that's a work in progress that started out? Yeah, you know, eight years ago with a small little presentation and now consists Wait, what he's talking about right here is um he wants to the audience here to fully grasp and understand that um he didn't mean to stumble what he found and what he was researching. Um because he's actually a little scientist to go ahead and look for it if it's information. Um but he wanted the audience to really comprehend that what he started was researching became together putting together and this is what he found and he was only trying to get your attention um to jumble a whole bunch of information and to take it down and try to condense it to a two hour period even though that still consists is very long he just wanted to go ahead and least of volumes and volumes of of research and discovery that is i for one certainly did not expect to happen to me so let's kick off um the history of our planet is far more mysterious and stranger than most of us would ever realize. And just by talking to the people here, it becomes very evident. The more people you talk to at this conference, the more evident it becomes. And the interesting thing is that the more, the closer you get to this beautiful blue planet, the more you realize how deeply divided we are as a species. And it's that division, very constructively created division that is being used against ourselves. And this becomes very evident by the end of my presentation. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The great human puzzle. Who are we? Where do we come from? Why are we here? Everyone has asked those questions, the three holy trinity questions, if you can call them that. That sounds so simple. We should have all these answers at our fingertips, and yet we can't, you know, define these answers with any kind of confidence. Because every time we think we've reached some sort of answer, Everything shifts and changes. It's true. It sends us in a completely it's different direction. Always seem to change through the discoveries and, uh, and things you find. I normally have a lot more slides here to go into much more detail, but I edited those out. <laughs> Sound and resonance seem to be the common denominators of religion and creation. No matter how far back you go, no matter how many civilizations you look at, eventually, if you scratch deep enough, that's what you're going to find. Sound, resonance, frequency, but pr primordially, the sound. And it also somehow connects us to opening us to understanding high levels of consciousness. And that becomes very important as we go through this presentation. In Christianity, it's the word. God said, let there be light. Okay, let's not get into the semantics. Yes, that we can define that in very various ways. But let's look at the basic stuff that we're dealing with here. The word. Okay, when he means don't look at semantics, he means don't get into everyone's belief of what they believe or not. Let's just go by the, the pure facts and the information of it all. Like, the information that we have for front and full and fall facts as it's written, as it's proposed, and how is it placed, regardless what religion he puts it on there. Um, facts, you know, I mean, proof of evidence. Anything can be bullshitted left or right, no offense. But when it comes to actual hard front facts, you know, I mean, these are the things you wanted to look at and get into and be realizing why do they have this consistent pattern. That's what you want to start your research in. 
First there was the word. In Hinduism we got the Om, the primordial creative source. The Egyptians sang the universe into creation. All comes to sound. And it gets more interesting as you get to look at some of the more bizarre and ancient cultures. And you can see this, how these days of creation and the creation, the sound of creation is manifested in some of the symbology used in sacred geometry. For example, Christianity can be very quickly described with sacred geometric principles. And you realize that the creator of the universe is not some guy with a white beard sitting on a cloud. You know that. What he's talking about, um, those who are not religious, mean, mathematics is actually can be can defined, figure out so many things, equations, even the consistence or non-existence of like, Jesus Christ, the God, anyone in mighty, or a higher being, or whatever you want to call it. The point of the matter is you can, with math, you can figure out the jigger points and the sound frequencies. What he's talking about residence when he says um, sound residence. I think of, you know, like solar light, things speed of light. There's no, there's a certain type of levels that we can't see and a certain kind of um, rate, like, like a radiology, like radi radiance that, you know, you can't really see in the around the world. We're only humans are only a short to see only a certain sort of base of it. But there's still a long grass base of it when you look in science about even things we can't even see towards the eye. But, you know, you can also hear what works the sound. So that's what he's grasping up a little bit in here okay that's just complete fairy tale stuff and very distinct part of the control system of humanity that division principle plays itself out in that philosophy six aspects of om or the omani padme hum you sound you see sound frequencies related to the creation process and in uh, in Egyptology, the six aspects of the all-seeing eye of Horus. And when you see this, you realize that we're dealing with sound. Six resonance ratios, all to do with sound frequencies. So sound plays a very important role. And one of the lesser known statements or thought patterns of Nikola Tesla that a lot of people seem to miss is that te um, Nikola Tesla said that the earth rings like a bell. It's continuously ringing like a bell. And if you know how to use this primordial source, sound frequency of Mother Earth, you'll know how to convert it into an unlimited source of energy. And I believe that's what he really did. What he did with it up at the top of the tower remains a mystery to most of us, and we all try to emulate that. But I believe that he was talking about the sound of Gaia, an unlimited free source of energy. Yeah. All right. It has been proven that... The speed of light, even though how quickly and fast we're sounding, it's still a frequency. But a, what a frequency that is faster than that, believe it or not, is sound. Sound is a frequency that it is faster than the speed of light. And there's been proof of evidence that you'll see in, in the video that when he's talking about there are certain pitches or noise that make an object move, what the other would consider magic. But he's saying that that's the type of energy. Like it has to do with the um, principle with um, the saying that goes an object in motion will stay in motion unless it's interrupted by outside force. Same thing with the principle of an object in rest will stay in rest, you know, what I mean, until moved by an outside force. That's all clean clean with the simple notion of sound, and that's what he means by sound resonate. And this plays a very important part in all of creation, in all ancient cultures, in all the belief systems. And I believe Tesla used this to do whatever he did to create this free energy that we all try to, to emulate. But what is sound? What is sound? Because we think that sound is just something that travels at a finite uh, speed. Well, that's been busted now because in Tennessee, uh, you studied at, at, uh, in Tennessee, didn't you, Brooks? Uh, at the Middle State Tennessee University in 2005, there were three high school students and two undergraduates that proved that sound travels beyond the speed of light. I'm not going to go into that, but that's an interesting thing to contemplate. That's one of the best kept secrets of science and physics. Never made it into the mainstream news bulletins. Sound boils water. This is a guy called Peter Davy in New Zealand. Since 1940, this guy's been boiling water with sound. Sound frequency. It's not complicated. Because everything has a resonance. Everything in the creation and in physical form has its own fundamental resonant frequencies. If we understand the resonance and the sound behind the resonance, we can do everything. 
because if sound created the universe and all things in it, because that was done by God, then we should be able to use sound to do everything else. Okay, what he's talking about, everything in, in life has a cause and effect. And simply put, it just, it is. The same thing as you put that everything has a formula. If you do it one way or this way, it can actually be done. Why not in the same frequency of sound itself? If we can tap into it and know the knowledge behind sound, we can actually use those type of sources and those type of methods to be able to create or do anything else, especially if sound of is, or most likely is hypothetically believed, to be the start of everything. Because when you think about the Big Bang Theory, we said absolutely out of nothingness came somethingness. But what was that that started the hitting? Because they say things were going to stay the same unless it's moved by an object force. So if you think logically, you mean if sound was the point of the human, of any sound that started everything, that hinged everything, that caused the fate, evolution of everything, then it should also be the reason we'd be able to do anything. So something so simple yet complex. A 92-year-old Christchurch inventor claims to have come up with a novel so way here to make he, a cup of tea. That he already did His like inventive the... contraption that he claims uses the power of sound to boil water. Beverly Lockhart went yep. to investigate. God, he's gone. And he was too... Nobody really knows how it works. Davy believes high frequency sonic vibrations emitted from okay, within the okay. silver bulb cause the water to boil. He says the idea came to him 50 years ago when he noticed different saxophone notes caused different household items to rattle. The mains powered gizmo has experts intrigued. Never seen anything like it. <laughs> Interesting symbol. And this is where you realize when the ancient cultures carved. I'm just trying to fast forward a little bit. The resistance to give the heating. I'm careful that I'm not everything. I okay, regardless if you the, believe in it or not, that it, he was actually and able to do this, on the, shelves, the point is, one it would happen. But before we were able to even have a shelf to have it, you know what I mean? See what happens. You, mean, yeah, you lose these type of things in information and science. But for now, Davy is savoring his gizmo's success and sticking to his own unique theory on how it works. Beverly Lockhart, three new. And in there lies the problem. He's dead. He took his secret yep. to his grave. He is very much so dead. We will never find out until we go there, try and wrestle, wrestle it out of his family to share the secret with the rest of the world. I can't believe that in all of the world of science and the brand, you know, the amazing laboratories that we have, there haven't been some scientists that have reverse engineered this or figured this out. It can't be that difficult. So resonant harmonic frequency of boiling water. Reverse engineer it. Measure the resonant harmonic frequency of boiling water and build the device. I don't have the laboratory to do it, but, you know, I've asked so many people to go out and do it, and no one's done it. So, but what we learn from this experience is... We're here at this conference talking about free energy. I believe free energy means free to the world, not just free that we can I suck it out of the, the vacuum and then sell it to the rest of the world. That's no longer free energy. I believe it's crucial that we start thinking about free energy as when you find it, like this guy, give it to the world for free. Because if you don't, they're going to get to you, they're going to get rid of you, and no one's going to get it. They were waiting. I, can't, I can imagine what the they, they, they did. When uh, Peter Davy died, they breathed a sigh of relief. So, oh, thank God, God he's gone. God. And he was too greedy to tell the world yeah. how the simple thing worked. Thank God, this human greed gene is so powerful that it prevents people from sharing this beautiful stuff. That's what I have a problem with. So what I urge anyone here at this conference to do, if you do find something like this, a source of free energy, do not keep it to yourself. Do not try and gain from the rest of humanity. Put it on the internet, make videos, put it out as widely as you can, share it for free with the world. It'll come back to you in abundance that you can't imagine. <laughs> and let me comment on that now. It is very, 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 so very, very true. When you share things to the world, like how the internet it was shared to us and presented to us, free information 
comes back and buddies it, it makes us more aware, more ability to know. And when we have more knowledge to know, the better we can are as humanity to grow to the next level. To lose just something as simple as this type of discovery could set us back for so many, so much, much years. And it could all easily prevent it if we just all share the information. And what are we here as human beings to do anyway? To have families, to give our families the best chance, or children the best chance, and the best knowledge that we could possibly give, and just to grow. If, if that's the true concept of what we're here for, then why aren't we doing it? It's just mind-boggling. Right. Sound levitates. All ancient cultures talk about levitating things with sound, not just sound, but also with mind and thought. Now, we hear about it all the time, but until you see something being levitated by sound, it's difficult to comprehend. Here's a beautiful example. Most of this stuff exists on YouTube, but we don't go looking for it. So, um, Notice that you can hear the sound frequencies because the item they are levitating are very light. I mean, the higher the frequency, the higher the energy. So these polystyrene items are very light, so the, the, the frequency is lower frequency that's audible to our ears. So when you try to levitate giant blocks, you would need very high frequencies that you can't hear. And then it looks like magic. Also note that the sound source comes from two different sound sources and it seems to levitate it at the cross point. The crossroad of the sound frequencies, that's what the levitation effect is. This is very important later in my presentation. And the knowledge of the ancient cultures. See that? By hearing a little sound, you can see how something can be easily it's levitated or it looks like magic. Variation and the thing starts to tumble and spin. And that's crazy, isn't it? Frequency of energy that's the first one is weird lens that shows you if something goes on and on and on just because you can't hear it anymore doesn't mean it's not necessarily there so here's a three-dimensional bubble that's created at the sound but look on the right hand side at the cross section of it what do you see you start seeing one of the most commonly recognized religious symbols why did the religions okay we're gonna go a little bit further here Let's see he does the sound thing because that made me realize that we're dealing with something very special. Since I first started going there and taking psychics and connected people, liberation movement, I'm going through it now. Just hold, hold on, it happens. And this is my message to everyone in the world. This is where the true humanity shines. And we realize how beautifully we can survive without money. We have to find a new system because this system is broken. It doesn't This work. is very, very true. Um, we cannot continue doing what we've been doing for the past 6,000 years. That is insanity. And as you know, insanity is defined as doing something over and over again and expecting different results. <laughs> so okay, after 6,000 years, we now have learned. Don't try and fix the current system. Change it completely. What is the one thing that we can do to change it? You this I totally complete. And this is where the Ubuntu Liberation Movement comes in. <laughs> Join the movement. Realize it's a movement about higher consciousness. It's about... It's about breaking all the norms that we've been conditioned to believe, standing up to authority, nine and a half, seventy-seven degrees. But then, we, days, did you know that in 1980, 80, in the mid-80s, four of the North American uh, native tribes came to South Africa to meet with Crater Mutwa and some of the African shaman because they believe that the new age will rise out of South Africa. Fictions on humanity are endless and they're getting worse by the day. The current situation is very simple. Every social political system has failed us. This is why we're in this mess. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about this stuff, right? If it was hunky dory. Humans everywhere live in misery. There seems to be no happy outcome to the political and economic mess of the planet. Every year, every month, it gets worse. More poverty, more hunger, more homelessness, more misery. The global economic collapse is imminent. The fact that we still have a global economic system is actually miraculous, but it is a clear indication how powerful those individuals are that control the global economy. They have infinite power as it is now. Only us, only we can do something about it. And there's some simple things that we can do about it to change everything about it. Okay. What he's talking about when it comes to global trade, you guys can go ahead and look it up. Look it up yourselves and you'll see. 
the banks are completely broke. It's true. They are basically shuffling cookbooks. They have no clue what the real trade market is, and it's done really ridiculously. It has no business sense and logic whatsoever. Um, and there's no money. There's no gold. And there's nothing. It's just shuffling around paper IOUs around, which is, like I said, amazing that it's keep on going that way, but really there is no money. There is no trade. And because of it, if this doesn't change soon, which is very soon, the whole, it's going to be an economical crash through the whole entire world, once again. Our lives and how we continue living as living, breathing human beings and not numbers and corporations or fictitious fictional entities. One third of the world's food goes to waste. This is spectacular. What kind of creatures have we become that we deny one third of the global population food because they don't have money? <laughs> we don't give. We don't hand it out. We dump it. We destroy it because we can't give it to them for free. They need money. They need we to work. Lazy work. bastards. <laughs> Do some work. Go get a job. Become That's a horrible. Respectable member of society. Get a job. We don't need jobs. Nope. It's the last thing we need. Every nope. time I hear politicians say we're going to create jobs, I send shivers down my spine. It's the last thing we need. Busyness. Sure. Keep you busy running around, forgetting what you should be doing, what kind of life you should be living. It's all encoded in the language that we use. How did it get so bad? This is where we get back to what we've just been to, the ancient civilizations. A small group of royal political families and the banking elite families took control of the world. This didn't happen last year or 100 years ago. This happened thousands of years ago, people. Thousands of years It started ago. with the Sumerians about 6,000 years ago in the Middle East and Sumeria. When the Sumerian tablets tell us, when kingdom was lowered to earth from heaven, that's why I pointed it out to you. They tell us, kingdom was lowered to earth, suddenly we see these priest kings appear out of nowhere. How did these guys suddenly took on this higher than thou you know, situation? Who the hell are they? Where did they come from? Oh, people lived happily and, and suddenly one guy said, hold on, I'm going to be your king. You're going to have to work for me and pay taxes. Screw you, buddy. I don't know. <laughs> So how did these priest kings in ancient times become so powerful? Because they were appointed by the gods. I'm not talking about God with a big G here. I'm talking about the gods with a small G. These <laughs> arrogant pricks that came here and disturbed us on this beautiful planet. And what happened next after they appointed the priest kings? The most spectacular, miraculous thing happened. These priest kings created money. Money, <laughs> money is not part of natural evolution. This is a complete misunderstanding of human history. Anyone that teaches you that has not done their homework. Money was maliciously introduced in ancient times as a tool of enslavement, the absolute tool of enslavement, and we're feeling the worst brunt of it right now. Yep. We are the guys, we are the civilization, we are the, the people on, in the history of this planet right now that can make a change. It's up yep. to us what we do with this information and how we move from here forward. Today, there are three main banking families. There are arguably a few more. You want to go jump into ones, this? It's um, the one, the Rockefellers, the Morgans. Two, they control five, everything. They own all the zero, banks eight. in the world. How can I make the statement? Because they're the guys that bail out the banks when they go under. So they own them. It's simple, right? If you bail somebody out, you're going to own them. And you're not going to bail something out that you don't own or at least that you don't control. So the World Bank, the IMF, the BI, the Bank of International Settlement in Basel, Switzerland, most people aren't even aware that there's a thing called the Bank of International Settlement. When they discover this, they, oh, the World wow, Bank. that's amazing. I hope they're good people. I hope they're good people. <laughs> Can't they give us a loan? <laughs> <laughs> Remember, people, money doesn't exist. Nope. Okay, I'm going to get into this. Uh, yes, did you want to say? Okay. No, 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 I don't, no, 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 you, you're getting the wrong end of the stick. We, we, we created the, yes, you are. We created the Ubuntu <laughs> Liberation Movement. I'm going through it now. Just hold, hold on. You'll understand where I'm going with this. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, you'll get it. 
you, you'll get it by the time we finish here. I'm sure you will. Uh, the banking families own the world. Simple as that. If you don't believe that, then you also haven't done your homework. So, all the discussions we've been having, I've been going into many it's of these true. discussions. The money keeps coming up all the time. But remember, money doesn't exist. Money is just empty promises. It, there is no thing as money. In fact, for those of you that know, I've been, I've been actively involved in legal cases in South Africa against the banks. Not just the banks, against the Central Bank, the South African Reserve Bank, the Minister of Finance as well. I've even opened up a constitutional now, court case a against the banks, like the Minister of Finance and the Reserve Bank, uh, which had an interesting ending. If we have time, we can talk about that. But uh, it doesn't stop. Uh, two years ago, myself and a small group of other people, mostly Scott Cundall, started uh, asking the banks certain questions. And, um, and we couldn't get answers out of them. And then we started doing research and realizing how it all works and for the fractional reserve system, you all know that, or you should know that, and the fact that money doesn't exist. In fact, in the South African Bank Act, to my horror of horrors, and I was in court and I was doing research to stand up and defend myself because the only way we can do this is to, when you stand up in court and defend yourself. So we didn't use lawyers. I went there and I stood and defended myself against the, the most you know, highest paid lawyers money can buy. And not just one of them, I was alone in the court against the judge that you have to call my lord and bow down when you walk into the court, my lord. Yes, you do. And you start realizing the cabal, ritualistic club that these people belong to. It's spectacular. They wear black robes. And you go to go there and call it my lord, my lord. I, you know, I thought I was going to cause trouble at first, but then I bit my tongue and I didn't do that. <laughs> Smart <laughs> man. <laughs> and, and, but what I found is that in the Bank Act in South Africa, and I'm sure the same goes for, for the rest of the world, there is no definition for the word money. There is, however, a definition for bills of exchange, promissory notes, and negotiable instruments. And I realized the banks don't work with money. The banks work with promissory notes, bills of exchange, and negotiable instrument. And, and those are called liquid because they have value. Value, liquid They're assets. They're liquid, ne valuable instruments, negotiable instruments that banks work with behind the scenes. And this becomes really exciting and interesting. So we started realizing we could create promissory notes and bills of exchange and liquid negotiable instruments as soon as they have our signature on it. Yep. And we started doing some of this, just causing trouble anyway. It didn't get us very far because the judges didn't understand this at all. They thought we were, were just causing trouble with the courts. But nevertheless, what we managed to do in the three Supreme Court cases that I defended myself against these Banksters, <laughs> we managed to get very important things out of the lawyers or the bankers. They admitted to everything we accused them of. We accused them of breaking the, bank, the, the contract law because they don't have what they pretend to loan. Nope. They don't have the money. Nope. Remember, in contract law, you need, you can't lend something that you, you do don't not have. possess. So when that was one of our arguments. So we said, well, the banks aren't actually banks because they don't own any money. And they admitted, yes, no, we don't own any money. Don't so, okay, know. great. Judge, did you get that? <laughs> and, um, and then we said, well, that means that you're an agent and you're not a banker, so you can't charge interest and you can't come after me because the contract is null and void. Yep. And then we realized that they securitize your signature. They sell every document you have, every document you sign with your signature on it that has a value on it is sold into, in a process called securitization. Yeah. And uh, this is a global industry, global banking industry works in securitization, and they're very proud of it. They publish the securitization information on their websites, but then when you argue securitization in court, they deny it. They say, no, we don't know what you're talking about. No. And the judges don't go and do their homework, because the judges are so blinded by the banks and the lawyers, they just follow, they just can't imagine that the banks could be lying. <laughs> so they, they agree that they practice securitization, or first of all, they. They, they denied that, that there is anything called securitization. They accused us of being fanciful and, and making things up. <laughs> and, um, that they the method of denial, them. denial, and we bullshit. We accused them of not having local standing or any rights to start the action against you because they sell your documents and your contract to a third party called a special purpose vehicle. And that special purpose vehicle company is a third party that takes complete ownership of your property, your car, your credit card debt, your overdraft. Everything is securitized by the banks because they don't have money. That's how they make money for themselves. It's all shuffling paper and bookkeeping entries mm -hmm. and selling empty promises. And this is how junk bonds are created because once you haven't paid on your bond, three months after you haven't paid on your home loan, your bond, 
uh, that goes stale. The, what does the secure the SPV uh, does? They then claim insurance on it and they they file it. So the SPV gets paid. The bank has been paid the moment they sell your signature to them. Everyone's been paid, but you keep paying for your home loan for the next thirty years. The moment you stop paying, the bank comes after you, says you owe us money. There's a contract, my lord. See, he signed a contract. He owes us money. And the judge doesn't for one second say, well, hold on, let's look at the validity of this contract. Do you have rights to this contract? Who owns the property? So this has now been exposed. We are this close in South Africa. Myself and Scott Cuddle from New Economics Rights Alliance, we are this close from bringing down the banks. This close. So Bravo. Because they're just lying thieves. What you're talking, what you're talking about, the global banking industry, people, is nothing more than the largest legalized organized crime syndicate. Yep. That's what it is. So they're a bunch of criminals. We've got to do something about it to stop it. So I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got two cases against the banks now. One of five counts of fraud, uh, which they, don't, they haven't argued any of the points. They've argued why I'm, why I'm claiming all the money. Why am I claiming all the money? <laughs> they're not arguing any of the points. And Scott Cundall has got a case with the New York Economics Rights Alliance, which has become the third largest non-profit organization in South Africa in the last six months. About 160,000 members. Now, here's um, the key right here. Um, 13310, how to disable the constitutionality of being banks. We're about the government. to launch criminal charges against the banks, full-blown criminal charges, because the evidence is just becoming overwhelming. And all it's going to take now, one judgment, if there are any mathematicians here, you can see the complete insaneness of this. Out of thousands and thousands and thousands of court cases, people against banks, not one person has ever won a case against the banks. Just think about that. Clearly, this is stacked in favor of the banks. Heck yes. Clearly. And the judges are either paid off or they're too stupid to understand what's going on. But things have changed. We have a few situations in South Africa, we've had small victories where the banks withdrew. This is how clever they are. They withdraw before they get a judgment or they mm -hmm. abandon. Yep. So there isn't a precedent on the record. Perfect. So you can't then go and argue the precedent. So they're very clever with this. But we're going to force them into a judgment because of what we're doing. And um, it's just going to take the first judgment and then it's all over. The entire global banking system works on the same principles. And it's just going to be a domino effect. And we'll do what Iceland did, hopefully. Just reverse all the mortgage loans, reverse all the car loans, credit card, just, you know, just reverse everything because these thugs have stolen trillions from us and make <laughs> us their slaves. And that's exactly what they do. And this is linked to our education system because yep. most people are indoctrinated into this way of thinking since that's Okay, what well, he's going to, and the reason how it led us to Remus is through ignorance. So is, is ignorance truly blissful? That's the whole irony of everything. Our education system is the key thing that lets us know what's going on and how to read to understand these political, political, and even business world ethnic terminologies that they want to speak in a different term language, even scientifically different language, lingual, because they want to sound all fancy and mean us talking to a normal type of person. <sighs> but if you don't understand that lingo, then how are you going to know what's going to be ripped upon your eyes? You wouldn't. So that's why it's very, very essential and very, very important to have education and not to let anyone harm or damage or stop your education and not to let it be funded or hold it by the government you know education can never be hold it by the government because then they can try to put ways on it no i think we the people as the people should always hold our own education and have it in our own priority if you even within our own states down to our own cities education should never be federal it should just be state by state of everything and that's my belief Childhood. Um, this is our education system has nothing to do with learning. It's it's really developed and funded by the banking families um, to condition humanity education, to following one, orders three, four, five, five. and respecting authority. They control the contents of all the textbooks and and uh, transfer of information. Our schools are really just indoctrination camps to brainwash our children to follow orders yep. and to bow to authority. It's got nothing to do with learning, people. The money, con money controls the legal system, as I mentioned already. 
And uh, if you just look on the internet on a daily basis, you'll see that the economic collapse is just imminent. Yep. It's somehow being uh, kept alive. <laughs> the question is, and this is what I need to end on, because we can't keep talking about doom and gloom all the time. We need to talk about what are we going to do as a species? What are we going to do when it all collapses? And this is where the most exciting thing happens. And this is my message to everyone in the world. This is where the true humanity shines. And One, we realize three, five, how beautifully four, six. we can survive Isn't without that, money. Yeah. We have to find a new system because this system is broken. Yep, it doesn't a new work. system. Um, we cannot continue doing what we've been doing for the past 6,000 years. That is insanity. And as you mm -hmm. So he already has the energy you can see as he talks about the um, new system. Um, this system actually can work. I mean, imagine only people three hours a day how to go ahead and how to do things. If everyone just contribute a little bit what they are good at, the traits that they are good at, and sitting, I mean, the system can thrive. It has no business or no duty to have a person in a position that doesn't know what they're doing. It is no good for anyone else or anybody else. So that needs to stop. And I believe the system needs to be new and needs change. And you can hear more about it. But um, go ahead and take a look at the video. And, and if you have any more questions, leave your comments in below. And I'll be happy to answer them. But those are the key thing, points I wanted to point out to the video. All right. Later.